Hello and welcome to topic for value at risk at the portfolio level. So when I say at the portfolio level, we suppose that we have data with dates in one column. Typically we'd use daily data and the value of a portfolio in another column from which we can calculate either the profit and loss or the returns on the portfolio. We're not looking at the individual assets in the portfolio at all, not until further topics in this module. So these are the subtopics. Defining value at risk is what I'm going to cover in this video, and then we'll move on to the different models. The definition verbally is value at risk, V little a r, value at risk is a loss that we are confident will not be exceeded if the current portfolio is not rebalanced over a certain risk horizon. So value at risk, V-A-R, um, little a, not capital A. If it were capital A, it would stand for vector autoregression. And we're not doing econometrics in this module, so it's V little a R. It's a loss. So if we say value at risk is 1 million, it means that we are confident we won't lose more than a million over a certain period of time, provided we don't buy or sell anything in the portfolio. We don't rebalance the portfolio. We hold it as it is. Now, confident is put in inverted commas here because it's actually associated with a statistical confidence interval, okay? So, in fact, we have to have a parameter called alpha for the value at risk that measures how confident we are. So, um, some people say that um, alpha is... Um, 99%. Some people equivalently say that alpha is 1%. So let's just clear up that confusion. I use the small alpha because what I'm going to be considering is a distribution. The basics of a VAR model is to come up with some profit and loss distribution. We might actually look at a returns distribution but the important thing in terms of value at risk is a dollar amount. And so if this is zero, and this is dollars or pounds or whatever it is along this scale, we have a distribution, a probability distribution. So the area underneath it is going to be one, okay? Maybe something like that. It doesn't have to be a normal distribution. Now, the confidence level refers to some loss here. This is a profit, this is a loss. So if we were to, to take an area here of, call it alpha, then mathematically we can say that whatever this number is here, I'm going to call it minus var alpha, because obviously a different alpha would be a different quantile. Another way of saying that is that the probability that the PNL is less than this number is equal to alpha. And if you're not entirely sure of that, remember when we introduced quantiles in topic one, we had a general distribution for any random variable x, and an area corresponds to a probability. So if that is an area, call it p, the whole area is one underneath, then this is called x P, if you like, which is the quantile, the pth quantile, and the interpretation is that the probability that x is less than that pth quantile is p. Okay, 
So that's the definition of the quantile. And we looked at quantiles of a normal distribution. Um, for example, with a standard normal distribution, let's do it up here, which we normally call Z, then you may have called this thing Z alpha. Um, that's zero for a standard normal distribution, an N01 distribution. For example, if um, the area here is five percent of the total area, then this thing, the Z.05, was minus 1.645. If it's two and a half percent, this would be minus 1.96. And then it's symmetric. So on the top here, we would have plus 1.645 for the upper quantile and plus 1.96 for the upper 2.5 percent quantile. All right. So I, well, I prefer the use of the term phi to the minus one of alpha, which is the same thing as Z alpha there. But this is a little bit more mathematically precise. I would bet my bottom dollar, though, that the term that you used when you did hypothesis testing was the critical value Z alpha. It's the same thing. I call it phi to the minus one because phi is the distribution function. Anyway, so back to this density here. This diagram is a statement. You can either draw a diagram or you can state it like that. It, it is exactly the same thing. Okay. This diagram means that. Which also means that if the value at risk is 1 million, then this number is minus 1 million. Okay, because that is the loss. The loss is on that end and the profit is on that. And the value at risk is a loss. So on this slide, we multiply this alpha quantile by minus one. Can you see here? We multiply it by minus one. That makes it into a positive amount, even though it's a loss. And there's a little bit more because what, when I say P and L, what do I mean? I mean, some future profit, profit and loss over the next week or the next day, assuming I don't rebalance the portfolio. So this actually has H, it has a parameter with it. It's an H day P and L, or let's say H day P and L here. Or, and I'll put this little parameter here for the VAR. So that means that the probability that the H day P and L is less than, okay. And more than that, um, although this really is never something that we go into in any um, precise detail. Um, if we were to do a one year future p &L, we have to take into account the fact that things could inflate a lot over the next year. So maybe we should, any future prices, we should express in present value terms before we calculate the p and um, And it only really matters if H is very large to do the discounted H day p &L distribution. Um, but I've put it there just to be precise. So var H alpha is the alpha percent H day var. And that is minus one times the alpha quantile of the discounted H day p &L distribution. So what are these two parameters? Alpha is our significance level, um, or you could say one minus alpha percent is the confidence level. So a 1% VAR means that we are 99% confident that we will not lose more than this amount if our portfolio is not rebalanced. Or a 5% VAR means that we're 95% we're confident. So a 5% VAR 
won't be as big as a 1% VAR. Because if we're 99% confident we won't lose more than 1 million, then we can be maybe 95% confident we won't lose more than half a million, but not more than 1 million. So um, we can choose alpha and we can also choose H, the holding period, also called the risk horizon. We introduced this right at the beginning in um, mathematics, the difference between a, um, an investment horizon, which could be quite long, and the, the risk horizon, which tends to be much shorter. And that is the time period over which our current portfolio will not be rebalanced. So, for example, if we have a 5% daily VAR of 2 million, that means that we're 95% confident that we'll not lose more than $2 million when the portfolio is held without rebalancing over one day. And I'll talk about this next bullet point in a minute. If it's a 1% 10-day VAR of 15 million, that means that we're 99% confident that we would not lose more than $15 million when the portfolio is not rebalanced for 10 days. Okay. Now, when it comes to um, the confidence level, if we are 95% confident, that means that 5% of the time it will happen or one out of 20, 5% is one over 20. And similarly, if we're 99% confident, it means that 1% or one over 100 times, we would lose more than that. So, for example, in this case, 95, 1 in 20. So 1 in 20 days, because it's a daily bar, 1 in 20 days, we would lose more than $2 million. And this is a 1% 10 day. That means one 10 day and 10 trade, 10 risk days. We don't count the weekends. In every hundred fortnights, we would lose more than 15 million. Okay. That's how to interpret far. So, Here's some nice normal graphs. Let me draw them again to make them a little bit clearer. First of all, if I draw a daily PL, okay, so this would be a one day PL. Well, how much can my portfolio change? over a day. Not as much as it could change in value over a week. So obviously the expectation is zero, assuming we have an efficient market. We don't expect the price to be any different tomorrow. Um, but weekly, so I've got a five day PL here. Over the next week, it could change much more substantially, yeah? So that's why I have drawn it with a large variance. Um, and now if I do a cutoff level, say here, where this is, say, 5%, or I do a cutoff level here, where that is 5%, this number here, say, um, this is minus one, that's minus two, and that's minus three, and so forth. So for this number here, and say the PL is measured in million dollars, yeah? Then this means that the 5% one day VAR is equal to one million dollars. 
And this number, say that number is minus 2.4. And that means the 5% five day VAR is $2.4 million. Um, and let's just do one more thing on it. Shall we say that this number here where that area is 1% and that number there is minus 3.2, I'll say the 1% five day bar is 3.2 million dollars. Oh, one more. I've got another colour. I do like my colours. We are orange. Say this is 10% and that's minus 0 0.5. So up here, so I'm running out of space. This is one day distribution. So, and that's 10%. So that means that the 10% one day VAR is equal to 0.5 million. Okay, so that explains this diagram here. So how do we set those parameters? For banking regulations, um, we have to set H equals 10 in order to measure market risk capital requirements. We'll get onto that in the very last topic of this module. But when we back test the value at risk model, we have to set just one, H equals one for daily. So the models are, are built and they're tested on daily data and daily PL. But hedge funds or asset managers, corporate treasury, other institutional investors, they don't need to follow those regulations and they could have a much bigger H. Asset managers might report annual VAR figures, so they could have H's 250, okay? And for the alpha, the significance level, banking regulation sets two levels, 1% and 2.5% for the market risk capital requirements, which we'll cover in topic eight. But others might set a higher alpha, um, in other words, a lower confidence level. Very often asset managers will use alpha as 5%, they're only 95% confident. And so that would tend to reduce the VAR. The higher the alpha is, the smaller the VAR. Now, it relates to a quantile of the portfolio's profit and loss distribution. It's a level of loss. It's measured in dollars. But if a portfolio has been trending, as we've known from a previous video, the P&L is not so representative. Five years ago, a profit and loss of um, half a million may have seemed enormous. But now, because things have grown so much in value, half a million is actually not that significant. Or it could be the other way around if things have been trending downwards. So um, it's often the case that we will use returns rather than PL to actually measure the VAR. Um, and so we'll get VAR in a percentage value. And as with the beta and everything else, if we want to convert a percent into a dollar, we just multiply it by the current portfolio value. Now, we normally do that if we can, but if we've got a long short portfolio um, or if we're using, for example, cash flows, um, it doesn't make sense to look at returns uh, as the actual change in the value of the cash flow or change in the value of the long short portfolio that we need to use and measure VAR directly on the P&L. I think that's enough for this video and then I'll make the next one.